I believe the Lord is, would have us to study about divine healing. This is one of the cornerstones or stones, at least, in the foundation. This is part of what we heard yesterday, that the Lord would have us to study and meditate upon and consider and use to our own benefit and blessing for ourselves and for others. So we don't want to leave something out of the foundation. That would be a poor foundation. It might not stand. It might be a keystone that's left out. And it'd bring down the whole building if that keystone were to be neglected. We'll turn to James, the fifth chapter, starting at the 13th verse, familiar verses to us all. These are words of instruction to what to do when we're sick. <clears throat> fifth chapter of James, the 13th verse, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. We believe in prayer. And we believe God answers prayer. He doesn't always answer the way we think we might get an answer. He doesn't always answer in the time what we think we ought to have the answer. But God hears prayer. Amen. Daniel was a wonderful man of God. And he prayed and he kept on praying and he kept on praying. And it says for 21 days. And finally the answer came through and he said, I heard your prayer. Amen. God heard the, not the 21st day of prayer, but the first day of prayer, and all down through the 21 days. But Satan hindered, and finally the answer came. So sometimes that happens in life. We don't always get the answer the moment we pray. But he says, is any afflicted among you, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Very good, strong words and good sound instruction what to do when we need this uh, under these conditions and under these circumstances. <clears throat> Does it hold in the 20th century? Well, I don't read in my Bible that this, this is what to do up to a certain point and then after that, do something else. <clears throat> I remember reading about a missionary that went over to Africa. The man was really saved had a real zeal for the law, had spent a good deal of time over in China, then he felt the Lord had called him to go to Africa. He couldn't get clearance on his medical uh, board, I mean on his uh, missionary boards because of his health and his older age, and they would not clear him to go down to Africa. But he said, the Lord called me. How should man stop him? He felt the Lord had called him. So he started out, he and a few others, and he hadn't gotten even to his destination in Africa until he came down sick. And he never remembered reading these verses that I've read to you in the Bible. But there, in a, in a, as near as he could understand it, in a dying condition, he read these verses. He said to the young man that was with him, he said, have you ever read this before in the Bible? He didn't remember reading it either. And he said, I believe the Lord would have us to fulfill his word. And they said, well, let's obey it. Anoint me with oil and pray for me. Well, this young man said, oil? What kind of oil? He said, I don't care what kind. And the young man got some stove oil and anointed him with the oil and prayed for him. And the Lord healed him doesn't say what kind of oil. 
And there's no healing in the oil anyway. But just obedience to the Word of God. And that man lived for many years down there in Africa, and he began to witness and testify to the fact that God heals the sick. God has added to his ministry. God added to his teaching because he took him down through the valley of affliction. Now we know that we live in the 20th century and we have uh, lots of recourses other than this that we could well take. And the door is open. Take them if you want. We're not here to force you to follow the Bible way. We don't want to force you. It wouldn't do any good if we could. Well, we want to teach the Word. We want to just read what God has for His people, and then God helping us, hopefully we can follow that Word of God. I know that there are many, many circumstances in our lives that arise and, there are, that are, and, and sometimes it's, it's hard to know just exactly what to do. I know that many of our workmen work under uh, workmen's compensation uh, regulations by which if they're injured on uh, the job that there are provisions made for their welfare and their uh, medical assistance and doctor's assistance and so on and so forth for that and they cannot collect on that and have any of those benefits if they don't go for examinations. I, I know this enters into it. Maybe they even lose their job if they don't. But still, in all that, we have the Word of God. We have the Word of God. I'd rather go by that Word of God. I'd rather trust that Word of God. So we point out to you the Word of God. It takes faith. It takes a, a, a confidence in the pilot. And uh, we preach a, a, a born-again experience, a, an experience of salvation that delivers us from sin, and it, and it takes something to, to come to the place where the Lord gives us that experience. It isn't just a, a, matter, of a matter of a mental ascent. It, it, it takes some prayer. It takes some, uh, some meeting of God's conditions to have that wrought out in our lives, but God's grace is sufficient to help us on that, and he'll save us if we'll follow his word. And then sanctification takes more consecration and dedication of our lives, and we preach it, and we teach it, and we hope people will line by it. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost is an is a endowment of power that uh, is another foundation stone that we preach and teach because it's in the Word of God, and we hope people will line up to it. And uh, uh, divine healing is another one, and we hope people will line up to it. But we can't force people to. So we have to leave it up to the individual. We'll have to leave it up to you. But by God's help and grace, we want to be faithful to tell you what the Word of God has to say about it. You know, I think sometimes we do the wrong thing when we don't trust God for healing. I think sometimes we hinder God's plan for us. There's a danger. God has a plan for each one of us in our lives. He has a, he has a master plan. He has the overall plan. That started way back there in creation. And clear down from creation, all God has sustained life on what he created in those first six days. He sustained life. You know, they fear about a world uh, ex a population explosion and there won't be enough food and so on and so forth. I, I don't think we need to worry about that. Uh, really, I don't think we need to worry about that. I don't think that the Lord would have us uh, to go to the lengths that people are going to, to curb a population explosion because of, of uh, the lack of food and so on and so forth. After all, the divine creator put us here and he created the things that even the food that we're eating that grows from the ground, where'd it come from? Man make it? God made it. And it comes from the seed, and that seed dates back to the creation. Every bit of it. The animals that are slain and 
cooked and eaten and so on and so forth. They come from back from the creation. Think about that a minute. God is sustaining life with the present world population. He started out with one, then two, then three, and so on, up to the world's population, whatever it is now, somewhere up in the billions. But he's still sustaining life. There's still enough. Man hasn't had to, had to create anything in himself in order to do that. So, so God has taken care of that. That's the overall master plan. But God has individual plans for our lives. Individually. He sees our need. He knows. He says he knows the very hairs, the number of the hairs of our head. God, you know, it's a wonderful thing. They tell me that if you take the leaves of these trees, any trees, put them out under a, on a, a powerful microscope, and you'll find out that not two leaves are exactly alike. They're not two leaves exactly alike. They're individual. They tell me that the snow that falls and the snowflakes can be put under the microscope and you won't find two snowflakes exactly alike in their crystal uh, formation under that microscope. The stars out there and the billions of them he calls them by name. They're each individual. Each person on earth is an individual in God's sight. I have a twin brother that looks a lot like me, and a lot of people have a hard time telling us apart. But we're two different individuals. We have two different fingerprints, I guess. Everybody has a different fingerprint. There are no two alike. God made us and all his creation, and he has an individual plan for each one of us. An individual plan. If we let God have his way in our lives, he'll work out that plan, and it'll be a beautiful plan. More beautiful than the snowflake under the microscope. More beautiful than the leaf under the microscope. Our lives will be just blossom out and come out just beautiful in his will and in his plan and in his perfect design if we let him have his way. But the, but the fear I have is that we could, we could short-circuit that work. We could hinder it. On the airplane, coming here, I was just coming through a magazine, and it was a little article on drugs, and it showed two pictures. It showed a spider web, photograph of a spider web, and all its beauty that that spider had woven in a natural manner. And then it showed a picture of a spider web that that spider had woven after having been induced a little bit of drug into that spider. It was a very erratic web. It was very strange. Something completely foreign had been uh, admitted into the, uh, into the body of that little spider and some way or another he was not able, the same spider was not able to make that web the way he had made it before. So it's possible that something be injected in our lives, maybe not drugs, but just something in our lives that would hinder God's pattern, that would just interfere with what God would have wrought out in our lives. But this, this is the fear I have. This is the fear. If we don't let God have his way, there, there is a way in which we could, we could some way or another uh, uh, let man work out something, let man perform something in our lives or in our body, and, and it may succeed to a measure, and it may accomplish a certain end temporarily, but it might spoil God's plan for us. It might hinder what God is calling us for. It might interfere with that divine, beautiful, sacred plan that he has for your life or for mine. Let's turn to the 11th chapter of Hebrews. <clears throat> this is the heroes of faith. 33rd verse, after you've read and you're familiar with them, different examples, different people. 33rd verse, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, 
wax valiant in the fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. Let's stop there a minute. These were wonderful feats of faith. And they were, uh, and they and all those before it are chronicled here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for our encouragement and for our help. And God, in a marvelous and miraculous way, has undertaken many times, many times, and I'm sure probably most of us here can point back to times when the Lord, in his own miraculous way, stepped in and undertook for us. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It helps our faith. It encourages us. But listen, as we read on in these heroes of faith and the deeds that were done and the mighty miracles that were wrought, there's more to it. And it's in the same chapter. It says here, they were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, and were stoned, were sawn asunder, were slain with a sword. They wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Yeah. Didn't say anything about any deliverance for any of these. The whole last part of this. Didn't say that the sword got so close and then it was taken away. It said they were slain by the sword. They were slain by the sword. And those same people are among the heroes of faith. You know, sometimes I think it takes a little more faith to just accept what God gives us that it might be to just have the deliverance. Because God doesn't always deliver. Let's face it. This is, this is a, such a question to some people. How is it when God has promised that some people are still afflicted, some people still have sicknesses, some people still are uh, uh, this or that wrong with them in their body? Why, shouldn't every Christian have perfect health? Shouldn't everyone embrace the promises and have perfect health? Moses is an example that he had 120 years old. His, his uh, strength hadn't abated. His natural strength hadn't abated. His eyesight was still good. He didn't have to have any glasses like some of us have to have as crutches. I know that. But not everybody in the Old Testament lived like Moses. Not everybody in the New Testament did. Right while the Lord was preaching and healing and delivering, one of the most faithful men of God languished in a jail and finally was beheaded. Peter was cast into prison. And it says that Herod was going to slay him after Easter. He'd already slain James. But the Lord delivered Peter. Was James any less a hero of faith? Was John the Baptist any less uh, one of God's chosen ones than anybody else that the Lord healed? Will their reward be any less because they didn't get a healing, a deliverance, a miracle? Will James be in a lesser place than Peter was because the Lord came down the night before Peter was to be slain and struck him on the side and said, get up and get out of this place? No, I think the same Lord was over them all. But you see, the important thing is the Lord has a different pattern for each one of our lives. So when we get afflicted, we're not going to automatically say the Lord delivered Peter out of the jail, so he's going to deliver me. We can't automatically say that. We don't know how it's going to go. It's best to obey the Word of God and then just leave the result with the Lord. Let's turn to Luke. Luke, the 22nd chapter. <clears throat> this is our Lord. 41st verse. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeling down prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And he sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down 
to the ground. Here's a wonderful example of suffering. Here's a wonderful example of one who went before us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but he was the Son of God. Yes, indeed he was, but he came to earth as a man, and he lived here as a man, and he suffered, and he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and he prayed just like any of us would pray if we were in the, in the same place. We'd say, Father, let this cup pass from me. We'd ask for deliverance. We'd ask for, for relief. Of course we would. But I hope by the grace of God we can add one more thing. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I hope we can take that example too. I hope we can put the thing in the Lord's hand to the point that his will will be done in our lives, that the Lord will have his perfect way in our lives. In the end, if we're submitted to the Lord's will, in the end, his perfect will will be wrought in our lives. Our lives will be beautiful. Stephen preached one recorded sermon. Just one. And that did it. Why, we might say, if he'd have just used a little more wisdom, if he'd have just been a little more cautious, he might have lived and preached many, many sermons. Well, I don't know. Before he left this world, he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I think that's a pretty good way to leave this world. I think that's a pretty good way. I think that's a pretty good witness from heaven above that that man was doing the right thing, that he was letting the Lord have his way in his life. And he, and he, he finished his life just a young man. Sometimes, you know, the Lord takes young men, young women, sometimes very young ones, sometimes middle-aged. Sometimes he doesn't let us live our 70 years. Well, let that be in God's hands. Brother Cliff told us the other night, even if our lives are extended by one means or another, even if doctors are able to extend our lives, what does it do? It just extends time just a little bit more. It isn't a permanent extension. It is, it is, it's just a little bit farther down, and after all, all of us, all of us are marching to that day, aren't we? Pointed at a man wants to die. Let's face it. It isn't pleasant, but that's an appointment we'll all meet. There have only been two people on this earth that haven't met it by divine intervention. Now, I know we have the hope, and we might well should have the hope that by, by God's provision we can escape that, but we don't want to escape it just simply because we don't want to die. We want to see the Lord's coming. Amen. We want to see the Lord's coming. We hope it'll be quickly, as the closing verses of the Bible are, that it'll come quickly. We hope that because of the sin and the trouble and the turmoil on this earth, and we just pray that the Lord will come quickly. Now, if he comes that way, we have that hope that we'll miss the way of death. But if it, if it all goes naturally, we'll meet it. But it's just now or later or whenever it is in God's appointment. Let's leave it in God's hands. Let's leave it in God's hands. These heroes of faith didn't accept deliverance. What kind? Now, they would, have, they would have accepted deliverance if the Lord sent the deliverance. Amen. They would accept that kind. That comes from heaven. Amen. But there is, an, there is a kind of deliverance that these heroes of faith would not accept. Amen. And God's still looking for heroes of faith today. Amen. For those who will not accept some kind of man-made deliverance. Amen. Because that man-made deliverance might spoil the plan. It might spoil what God's trying to work out. So there's a danger, there's a grave danger when we take our lives out of God's hands and put them into man's hands. We might spoil God's plan when we come to be saved. I'm talking to Christians now. I'm talking to people who are saved. Once in a while, the Lord heals people that are unsaved, sinners. Yes, he does. We know that. And God's in God's hands. And sometimes the sinners can have a good deal of faith. But to Christians I'm speaking to, if we put our lives in God's hands, if we put our future in God's hands, if we say, I want to I make heaven my home, I'm going to trust the Lord to take care of me throughout eternity. I'm not going to grow old. I'm not going to have any infirmities. Everything's going to be wonderful in heaven. I'll never die. I'll never I'll go on and on and on and on without death and so on and so forth. We trust the Lord in that. We believe that, don't we? That's our confidence. 
Well, can't we trust that same God in the physical body while we're here for 70 years or less or more, whatever it is? Can't we trust that same God? Wouldn't it be pleasing to Him if we'd say, Lord, I, I, back there when I came to the fountain of blood, I put my life in Your hands, body, soul, and spirit. I put it all there. I didn't say, Lord, I put my spiritual welfare in Your hands. I'll trust You for eternity, but I won't trust You for time. I can't trust You for my physical body. I'll trust You for my glorified body. You know, that isn't very reasonable with the Lord, I don't think. That isn't being very rational with the Lord. I think the Lord would, would have us to say, Lord, I trust you with this body for time and for eternity. I believe the Lord would have us be careful with these bodies. As Brother John said, they're, they're temples of the Holy Ghost. We shouldn't defile them. Many, many, many years ago, before my memory, before I was ever born or in this church, this church had a council and, and considered something that was becoming quite prevalent in those days, cigarette smoking. And they considered that, whether that was uh, befitting a Christian or not. Now, it doesn't say in the Bible, thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. You won't find that in the Bible. If we don't find it in the Bible, then it's all right to do it. No. Times have changed. They didn't have cigarettes in those days. So, all right, a stand was taken contrary to many religious de denominations that the, the feeling was that cigarette smoking would be injurious to the body and that our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, we should not do anything willfully, directly, that would injure, injure the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, being a, a, a means of not being healthy for us, that it was decided that a real Christian would be delivered. And this was backed up by the fact that God saved people and he just delivered them from the habit of cigarettes. And so that was substantiated by God's deliverance. And so uh, that uh, uh, became a part of the belief of the apostolic faith way back then. Now in the later years, the government steps in, makes an investigation to find out that's true. Very injurious to health. One of our young men in Portland going to college there, he had to have one more class. He didn't know exactly what to take, but they... They had a class on cigarette smoking and a college credit for it. I don't know exactly what they called it. And he said you would be amazed. In their class, the whole class had to go up to the county hospital and they had to see and visit with men and women there in the last stages of emphysema. You ever see anybody with that? My wife and I were called out to pray for a woman call on the phone and between sucking on that oxygen and just barely getting her breath she could speak to us a little bit but thank the Lord we, we prayed with her and she prayed through made her peace with God it's a pitiful situation in that class they had to see lungs taken out of people that had been non-smokers and lungs taken out of people that had been smoking they said in that class all the worry about exhaust smoke and industrial smoke and all of these things, it's just, that's just pitting alongside of cigarette smoke. That's just infinitesimal alongside the air pollution that a person gets when they put that cigarette in their mouth and draw that smoke right in their lungs. And they come out flatly and say, 20 years. 20 years. You can't bank on any more. You'll get by with it a while. You'll say, it's all right, the brother said. He used to tell people, it doesn't hurt my health and cough in between. Well, God would have us take care of our bodies. God would have us that. But along with it, when our bodies become sick, when something goes wrong, God would have us trust him. God would have us trust him. Will we displease God if we say, Lord, I put my life in your hand, body, soul and spirit back there when he saved me. You know, it's a wonderful thing when we anoint and pray for someone as instructed we read here, when we can just have that confidence, this person has been to the fountain of blood. Amen. This person has been there and had their sins forgiven. And this person is a child of God and lives the Christian life. Now is just coming to obey the word of God. 
Why, there's a, just a wonderful confidence in it that God is going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. We can do that, you see, if we just trust Him fully. You know, there are many, <clears throat> many, many reasons why the Lord allows us to be afflicted. And that's a good study. I have a few notes here, but I don't know whether, whether we can take time for that. Uh, let's turn, though, to 1 Peter, 4th chapter. 1 Peter, the 4th chapter, just to take in a little bit here. 12th verse. <clears throat> It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partaker, partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, I know that takes a lot of grace to be able to rejoice when we're sick. This might take in sickness, this might take in persecutions, this might take in uh, hard problems and trials that we face or whatever it is, but let's just think of it as, as for, for the moment as, as sickness. Well, if, if our lives are in the Lord's hands and if we've committed everything in the Lord's hands, then whatever comes our way, we can just say, well, Lord, all things work together for good, can't we? That's a, a scripture in the 8th chapter of Romans, the 28th verse that all things work together for good. Now then, if we're saved and we're, we're following the Lord and we're trusting the Lord and we're his child, then if a trial comes, if a, an affliction comes, then Peter tells us, don't think it's strange concerning that. Some people, you know, they say, well, why? Why? Why did this happen? Well, I, I think there's a measure of saying why that's good because then we can examine ourselves. Maybe it's the chastening of the law. That's borne out in the Word of God that sometimes we are chastened. If we're sons, we're chastened. We're corrected. We're, we're admonished. We're spanked, as it were, by the law. And sometimes that's by means of affliction. And thank the Lord it is. Amen. Yes, we're sons if that happens. And we, we hope we are. And uh, uh, let the Lord, let it, let it have its perfect work in our lives. But if we've examined ourselves and we can't find anything wrong, and we, as far as we can see, we, we see, as Brother Crabtree says, the green light down there, and everything's clear, and no, no red lights flashing, no warning signs, no alerts, it's just all clear, then what are you going to say? Well, how come then? Why? No, Peter says, think it not strange. Just think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. After all, your life is in the Lord's hands, and he's just weaving that pattern. He's just working out that de design, that sovereign will in your life. He's just working that out. So then we ought not to think it's strange, whatever happens to it. We ought not to think it's, it's extraordinary. It's, it's completely out of God's sphere, and God has just forgotten about me now. The enemy will tell you that. If you want to listen to him, he'll say, the Lord just forgotten about you, but he hasn't. The enemy's a liar. He said he notes the sparrow that falls. How much more value are you than many sparrows? The very hairs of our head are all numbered. You know, you can check into the very best hospital and you can have the very best diagnosis and you won't come out with the number of hairs you got in your head. They'll skip by that one. and a whole lot more. But the Lord doesn't skip by any of them. He knows all about it. I remember one time one of our ministers was sick and my wife's cousin was visiting us and he was a doctor and happened to mention something about him. And of course he was interested. Well, what, what's the matter? What's the symptoms and so on and so forth? So we told him the symptoms and, and uh, he said, oh, that's a dark picture. That's a dark picture. Don't know much about that. That minister is still alive, very much alive after, I suppose that's maybe 20 years, still preaching the gospel, still proclaiming the wonderful love of God. And that man says, and he was honest. He said, that's, that's a dark picture. You know, doctors are honest, and they'll say, I've done all I can. I've done all I can. Some of them are so honest, they'll say, it's only God that can help you now. Well, I think it'd be better to have God help us all the way through. Amen. 
No, don't, don't go to God as the last extremity. Go to God first. Yeah. Go to the best doctor you can find. Yeah. The very best. After all, you want the best. Yeah. The great physician is the best. Amen. He'll diagnose your case. He won't say it's a dark picture. He won't say it's impossible. He won't say it's too far. I've done all I can. Bless God. There's nothing impossible with our God. Yeah. Nothing. God is able. Oh, we can trust him. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But just rejoice. Rejoice. Inasmuch as you're a partaker of Christ's sufferings. Bless God. The Lord suffered here on earth. Peter tells us about that. The innocent. Perfectly innocent. There was no reason for his suffering. That was not chastisement. That was not correction. That was not reproof. But he says, arm yourselves likewise, brethren. Ye also shall suffer in the flesh. As much as Christ has, we will too. Amen. Think it not strange. Just let the Lord have his way. Pray that the Lord will take this cup pass from, away from you. Pray that the Lord will heal you. And then pray, thy will be done that your perfect pattern may be wrought in my life. Have his way. Oh, that's the best way to live. There are more scriptures. Uh, here, on down the 19th verse, Therefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Yes. You have a machine that goes something goes wrong with it and you have, try to repair it and somebody else tries to repair it and sometimes you send it back to the factory there they made it to get it repaired. The Creator. We can commit our bodies to the faithful Creator. We believe God created them. We believe God made them. We believe God knows all about them. You know, they, the psalmist said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And sometimes when you get just a little bit insight into our own body one way or another, and uh, uh, sometimes we, we, we read about it and study about it, it it's wonderful. What is it? Uh, we have a billion blood cells, uh, bl um, um, blood cells, yes, in our, in our body. Uh, cells, that is, that the blood feeds, I should say. We have 100,000 miles of circuitry for the blood to get to those cells. A hundred thousand miles. If one of those goes bad, what are you going to do about it? I'd like to go to the Creator. I'd like to take it back to the Creator. And let Him take care of it. Oh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. The tree leaf is wonderfully made. But this was God's crowning creation. Made in God's image. Made in God's likeness. Oh, bless God. The next first verse of the next chapter. The elders which are among you I exhort, who also am an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Not only was Peter an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ, but he was a literal witness of the sufferings of Christ. But he said, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. It'll be worth it all. <clears throat> uh, just a few scriptures I'm going to... If you have your pencil and want to write them down I'll, uh, for your reference, in Romans 8, 16, it says, If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. Romans 8, 16, and 17. In Philippians 3, 10, and 11, Paul brings out about the fact that he wanted to be a partaker of Christ's suffering. A partaker of Christ's suffering. He wanted to be ready for the resurrection of the dead, and he wanted to be a partaker of Christ's suffering. And uh, in Psalms 119, in the 67th verse, he says that uh, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Yes. There's some benefits by being afflicted. There's some reasons behind it. If we go to the doctor and we get, uh, get ourselves fixed up, we might just short-circuit all that God is trying to work out in our lives. We might just cut it short and make an imperfect pattern for our lives. The, uh, in the house on the 119th Psalm, the 71st verse, it says that 
by being afflicted, he learned the Lord's statutes. 22nd chapter of Genesis, wonderful chapter, tells that God did tempt Abraham. That wasn't pleasant. That was just about the hardest trial that Abraham could ever have to go through. It would be hard for us. But Abraham's son Isaac was a son of promise. Yeah. And through him was all the nations of the earth to be blessed. And then the Lord did tempt Abraham or try him. The meaning is there. And he said, you take, a, uh, you take Isaac up there on the mountain, I'll show you. And you offer him there for a burnt offering under the law. He didn't accept deliverance. He didn't try to make some other way out. He didn't try to say, let this cup pass from me and stop there. He didn't tell the Lord, remember, he's the son of promise. And if I take him up there on that mountain and I slay him there and offer him and burn him up for a burnt offering unto the Lord, how will the promises be fulfilled? The 11th chapter of Hebrews tells us how he felt about it. Why he said, I got him from the dead. The Lord will raise him from the dead. You know what that did for Abraham? The father of faith, it increased his faith. Amen. You want to have more faith? Come to camp meeting, that's a good way. Pray, hear the word preach. The word, the preaching of that word gives faith. But you know there's one other good way substantiating the 22nd chapter of Revelation and the 11th chapter of Hebrews when you tie the two together. The trial of our faith will increase our faith. The using of our faith will increase our faith. The, the trial of our faith, it's uh, more precious than gold. Let's turn to that. First Peter, the first chapter, and the seventh verse. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When the Lord comes, we want the perfect pattern. We don't want a distorted pattern. When the trump of God sounds, we want to be in the very center of God's divine will. We want to be listening. We want to be living. We want to be witnessing and working, yes. But we want to be just where the Lord would have us to be. Suppose the Lord were to come during camp meeting here at Murfreesboro. Suppose that uh, at the midnight hour or in the early morning hour or during an altar service or sometime like that, suddenly the trump of God should sound. We want the perfect will of God in our lives. We want him to have his way. We want to be ready to go up. It's going to be a precious thing. It's going to be a small infinitesimal minority that's ready to go. They're going to hear that sound. So much so that the Lord said, when he cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. But here it says that the trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at his appearing. When he comes, have his perfect way. You might be laying in a bed of affliction when the Lord calls. But it'd be better be there and be in the center of his will. If that's his will. It better be there. Oh, I don't want to discourage you from exercising faith for healing. I remember now, we read the fifth chapter of James. We read what to do. And it said, the prayer of faith shall heal the sick, save the sick, and they shall be raised up. And we believe this, and we've seen it happen, time without number. But it doesn't always happen. And sometimes this is the thing that, that overthrows the faith of some. We don't want that to happen. Leave it in God's hands. Trust the Lord. If it doesn't happen just when you think it ought to happen, trust the Lord. Let him work out his will. Maybe he's teaching you some of his statutes. Maybe he's, listen, some of the most precious experiences that Christians have had have been in the valley of affliction. In Isaiah, the 48th chapter, it tells us that we are called in the furnace of affliction. Sometimes right down there in the very furnace of affliction. 
that the Lord reveals his call to us. He reveals what he'd have us do. We couldn't perhaps slow down enough. We couldn't consecrate enough. We couldn't uh, take a little time for prayer enough in a good, healthy, strong body. And sometimes the Lord has to take us down there to get us to where we'll meditate and think and pray and consecrate and draw near to the Lord. And we've had some experiences there that have been just about on par to the salvation, sanctification of the baptism. Just about as highlights in our lives as those spiritual experiences that make us ready for the rapture because we tarry before the Lord, we let him have his way, we trusted him. Listen, if you go to the doctor and get his pills, or you go to the, uh, to the operating table and get the surgery, you might cut all that short. You might just spoil what the Lord's trying to work out in your life. There's a grave danger in doing that. I feel that way at least. I wouldn't want to do that in my life. Uh, but God helping me, I wouldn't want to do that. I'd want to let the Lord have his way. I've been through a few afflictions too. I know about down to being at the, uh, down at the wire, so to speak, at the valley of the shadow of death. But I know that uh, I can fear no evil there, for thou art with me. I know that I can prove God's word there. I know that God is able to heal. I don't have time to go into my own personal experiences. But, oh, bless God, I wouldn't trade him for a million dollars. I wouldn't trade him. I wouldn't trade that day when I read the 119th Psalm and that 71st verse where it says, It's good for me that I have been afflicted. And I said, Oh, God, that's for me. I can't understand it now. But da David couldn't either. So he put it in the past tense. After it was all over, he said, It was good for me that I was afflicted. He didn't say, it's good for me that I am afflicted. He said, it's good for me that I have been afflicted. And I'll tell you, I feel a lot more confident in praying for the sick after I've been down there to the valley of the shadow of death. After I've been there uh, where the family came in, my unsaved brother came in and got my mother to the side and said, what are you going to do? Just let him lay there and die? You better get a doctor. Throat infection. Quincy until I couldn't sleep, couldn't drink, couldn't eat, could scarcely breathe. My mother became fearful, bless her heart, but she had a reason for it. Her oldest son died with diphtheria, and she was fearful, and she came and talked to me, and I said, all right, I'll be fair. As best I could, I said, I'll be fair. Give me a chance to pray about it. We don't want to do anything unwise. Give me a chance to pray about it. The more I prayed about it, the more I felt this has to be in the Lord's hand. This is the Lord's battle and not man. If I'd do that, I'd cut it short. Oh, Brother Ed talked to me about preaching. Well, the Lord had talked to me before that. And when Brother Ed talked to me about preaching, I said, Brother Ed, I, I just don't feel I'm qualified. And then he, then he just hit me right between the eyes. He said, don't you feel the Lord called you? I said, yes, Brother Ray, I do. Well, then he says, don't you think the Lord's grace is sufficient? And I said, it's all sufficient. I couldn't say any more. I didn't preach for 13 months. But in that time, I went down through the valley of the shadow of death. And I said, Lord, this is in your hands. And it'd just be so much easier if I didn't have to preach and you just took me. I was saved. I was sanctified. I had my baptism. And I just said, this battle would just be so much easier if you'd just take me. And I, but I read that song. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Yeah. And every day since then, every time I've ever had to pray for the sick, I can say it's good for me that I've been there, that I've been there. My sister, Ruth Ashwell, stood by my bed. She worked in the office, but she stayed up nights to keep me awake from choking. She, she did everything she could. She stuck with me. My mother uh, also sided in. I said, you take me. You call the doctor when I go in time. I'll not do it in my own time. But that day when I read that scripture, the whole thing broke. The pus and the blood and the corruption flowed out. And oh, God did it. God did it. I've had a few other close scrapes since then. But oh, I'm glad I'm living here. I'm living on borrowed time. I believe that. I believe that. I've had some accidents that just came so close uh, many times.
But oh, it's in God's hand. I want to live every day that I'm ready to go, ready to meet the Lord. Listen, let's turn to another scripture. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. I had many other scriptures here, but we're running out of time. 2 Corinthians, the, third, the first chapter and the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. We can comfort the person that goes down through the valley of the shadow of death because we've been comforted there, because we've experienced that. And so he says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of all comfort. Not the assurance of the doctor that this little operation will just take care of it all. I don't want that comfort. I'd just be afraid. Maybe I'm a coward. But I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of that. And, but he says, who comforteth us in our tribulation. And that's common to all Christians. I, I think it'd just be wonderful to go through the Christian life and just have everything go smooth and easy and blessings just pour down on us and good health and strong body and, uh, and victories and mountaintop experience. That'd just be wonderful, wouldn't it? All the way from earth to glory. <clears throat> well, we can dream about it, but it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Dream about it if you want. But, oh, let's face the reality. There are tribulations. But there's a comfort in tribulation, bless God, if we're where the Lord wants us to be, that we may comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So there's a reason for us to go down through those tribulations, and that reason many times is that we might be a help to others. When they go through it, God wants to use us. Brother Bob James said, I, I want to be used to the Lord. Well, the Lord put him through a lot of fiery trials of afflictions down through the years, too. But bless God, he's held fast, and now he wants to be used to the Lord, and the Lord can use us in different ways. Maybe that's the way to be a comfort to those who need comfort in tribulation. How much comfort are we going to be if we've never been there? But oh, bless God. For as the suffering of Christ, I think this is very important. The sufferings of Christ. You see, when these sufferings are not sufferings that we've brought on ourselves by our own disobedience, by our own mistakes, by our own failures, those sufferings are the chastening of the Lord, and that's good that we have those, and thank the Lord we do. But then there, there's another kind of suffering. That's the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ are the sufferings that we didn't bring on ourselves because Christ didn't bring on his suffering. They're the sufferings that we suffer innocently, not having done anything that's wrong. So he says here, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, ye shall also, ye shall be also of the consolation. You want the consolation? You've got to go through the suffering. But you can have that consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you be ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were, listen, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. We don't know exactly what this was, but he says we were pressed out of measure, out of measure, above strength, beyond the limit of human endurance. One brother uh, said, if the Lord will just sustain me that I can just endure. And somebody said, well, what will you do when it's beyond that point? Well, he said, just endure. Just endure. Amen. He said here, we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. 
But we had the sins of death in ourselves, and we all do. We all do. Amen. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Pressed beyond measure. Just gave up our hope of life. But still, God is able to even raise the dead. And so their faith reached out yet. Bless God. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us? Past tense, he did deliver us. He does now deliver us. Paul didn't know what the future held, but he said he will deliver us. He went to the, he went to the execution and he could write to Timothy. Now this is the end. The last appeal. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith, bless God. Can we say that? I've kept the faith. Not the faith in doctors. Not the faith in medicine. They do good. They do wonderful. We'll have to, we'll have to acknowledge that. And sinners should go to the doctor and have him take care of them. But we have a greater doctor. We have a greater physician. We have a more wonderful one, and we're not sinners, and we don't want our lives marred by the hand of man. Oh, we'll trust him. We'll trust him. We trusted him back there. We trust him now. We'll trust him for the future. That's what Paul said. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be made, might be given by many on our behalf. Oh, if many prayed, many can give thanks. Many can rejoice. Glory to God. Oh, I'd like to take just a few more minutes. Brother Cliff said we're at camp meeting here 24 hours a day. <clears throat> Sister Ruth McCollum testified the other night, but she didn't tell about her heat. Amen. Brother Dave and Sister Ruth were in Shehala. Sister Ruth took sick. Nine to death, just on the line. Day after day. Day after day. You know, people in that town were beginning to say, that preacher down there believes in divine healing, and his wife died. He didn't stack up to them. Oh, this makes a hard try. He didn't want to be a disgrace to the gospel. Neither one of them want to be a disgrace to the gospel. And yet... Where's this line? Where's this point? It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. Sister Ruth had just put her legs over the side of the bed and they turned off. Her heart was so bad. But they just held on. They just held on. You imagine. Missionaries over in Newfoundland now. Travel in the automobile 2,800 miles to be here. Looks to me like Sister Ruth McCollum's in pretty good health. Amen. Does it pay? Yes. Would you like to have them pray for you when you get sick? I sure wouldn't mind that. I'd like to have somebody like that pray for me when I'm sick. Amen. The Lord undertook one day, and the Lord healed her. Oh, there was some testing after that, but the Lord undertook. The Lord will not fail. Well, you say, I know somebody that trusted the Lord and he died. Well, I do too. Amen. Amen. Everybody but two on earth. Whether they trusted the Lord or not, because that's an appointment. The Lord tarry, Sister Ruth McCollum will die too. Sure. But that isn't defeat for the Christian. No matter if the neighbors say, well, if you had just had an operation, or if you had just done that, even if the Lord takes us, Bless God. Even if it's down through the valley of the shadow of death and right on through, that's victory if we keep our trust in the Lord. Is that defeat? Step over into heaven? Was it defeat for Stephen? When the Lord opened heaven and, and revealed himself standing there at the right hand of God, was that defeat for Stephen? Had he done the wrong thing? I say that's victory. When any saint of God crosses the river, no matter what it may be, sometimes, you know, we say, well, if the Lord had healed that one, it'd be such a wonderful witness. Well, it could be, but we're not, we can't be sure that it will be. The Lord healed 
people on earth, the Lord Jesus did, and not everybody that saw it believed.